Hello and welcome to today's Cuyahoga County Press Briefing. Today we are joined by County Executive Armin Budish, Justice Stenner Steering Committee's Owner Representative Jeff Applebaum, and County Municipal Advisor and Managing Director of Stiefel Public Finance, Bob France. We will begin by hearing from our speakers and then end with some questions. Just a reminder to the media to please uh, remain muted during uh, speakers. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Executive Budich. Thank you, Devin. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. In 2019, the Justice Center Steering Committee was created. This committee, which is comprised of 12 representatives from the county, county council, the common police court, city of Cleveland, and the prosecutor's office, has been working diligently to determine the best, most impactful future for our corrections off, uh, center. What the committee determined was that a new jail was needed. I don't think there's anyone that would deny that we need a new jail. Our current jail is not appropriate to serve the needs of Cuyahoga County. A new correction center would be more efficient and effective, and it would comply with all statutory mandates. Today, we're gonna to let you know how we plan to fund this new correction center. Please understand that the information we'll provide today is still preliminary since we just hired the criteria architect and this plan must still be considered by council as well. I'm happy to have Jeff Applebaum and Bob France here with me today. Jeff will go first. He's the managing director of project management consultants. He's been the Justice Center Steering Committee owner's representative. And he's gonna talk about why we desperately need a new jail, what it could look like and what it's likely to cost. Jeff? Thank you, Armin. Um, so I don't think there's much dispute about the fact that we need a new facility. Uh, the current jails have been extensively studied since 2013. Uh, it started with the facilities assessment report, a facilities planning report, multiple investigations by members of our programming team comparing renovation versus build new options. Uh, versus even do nothing options. Uh, and uh, all of this information has been presented in a series of public meetings, multiple studies and presentations, uh, and ultimately uh, the determination by the steering committee through a unanimous vote was that we needed construction of a new jail on a new site without further delay. And by the way, when we talk about a new jail, it's a correction center. It doesn't just include a jail, it also includes sheriff's administration, uh, parking and other features. Uh, so why did the committee come to this conclusion? Why have all the studies come to this conclusion? Well, essentially uh, it's, it's about comparing different options, uh, a do nothing option, the option of renovating, the option of building new. Uh, we know from all the studies done that the, the cost just to fix what is broken without making any operational or programmatic upgrades would exceed in 2020 dollars, uh, $304 million. Uh, and that's based on taking the original studies, uh, up, uh, updating them for current cost. Uh, and this was all, by the way, in a steering committee last November. You can look and see the detail of all this. And keep in mind, this is with the difficulty of renovating a fully occupied building. Uh, you would actually have to move uh, inmates out, move them around and, and fix areas while you are trying to uh, do construction, a very difficult process. But that process, uh, even if we did it and completed it, the result would be buildings that have not changed operationally or programmatically. They would still be highly inefficient. You can't, for example, change the number of cells in every housing unit in jail one. Uh, you can't uh, change the uh, adjacencies of, for, for example, recreation and housing areas. Uh, you, can't, you can't really improve in any dramatic way inmate movement or fundamental intake processes. So we would end up with a facility that the pieces and parts that are broken would be fixed, but operationally it would still be inadequate and wouldn't meet modern standards. Uh, moreover, you can't take those buildings and make them more flexible to accommodate either increases or decreases in future jail population. They simply don't work for a, a number of reasons after extensive study. Also, the cost of doing nothing and delaying, you can't really kick the project, th th this problem down the road. The studies have shown that costs us about $45 million a year to do that. So what are the benefits of building new? 
First of all, the buildings that we create would be operationally far more efficient. Current studies indicate that at a minimum, we'd have savings of $9 million a year, just in terms of the uh, enhanced operations of a new building. More importantly, I think though, we'd be creating a far safer, more secure and healthier environment for both the inmates and the staff with many operational and programmatic advantages. Uh, there would be better outcomes for the inmates, better outcomes for the justice system, and a far more attractive environment for hiring and retaining the best correction staff. All of these are critical goals, which would be very difficult, if not impossible to meet uh, in the existing uh, uh, buildings if we renovated them. Uh, the new facility would also be far more flexible in terms of housing units that could be added on a modular basis. You can't take the current building and really in any easy way, either uh, uh, downsize it or create uh, significantly more opportunity for housing. Uh, uh, it, is, it is a fixed structure. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, what are we talking about doing right now? Uh, we are going forward. Uh, the current budget that we have set for the project is in the range of 525 to 550 million dollars. Now this is dependent on a lot of factors that obviously are still uh, somewhat unknown. Uh, one of them is site acquisition. Uh, when we when we uh, we have not yet acquired the site, we're working on the site the site review process, but. Uh, the cost will vary depending on the site and the costs associated with the site. Uh, the initial number of housing units to be constructed, it still has to be finally determined. We know the steering committee has said uh, that we're going to start with not less than 1,600. It would be expandable to 2,400. We obviously want to build this with as few housing units as we can, but we obviously also have to accommodate uh, growth trends. So the final number of housing units, at least initially, that we're going to build uh, will have an impact on where we end up with the budget. And finally, construction market conditions. We all know, and we've all read stories about uh, wild swings right now in price, uh, cost and availability of labor, uh, shortages, materials. Hopefully that's going to stabilize as we move through the pandemic, but that's also an unknown. That's why we have contingencies in the budget. So what is the current status of the project right now? The criteria, the criteria architect is fully engaged. Uh, the design build builder selection uh, is actually underway. We issued the RFQ for the design builder uh, on Monday of this week. So we will have a design builder within the next few months. And uh, the schedule calls for getting to a guaranteed maximum price in about 10 months uh, with a fully designed uh, 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 design development being completed. Uh, and right now we are still uh, anticipating project completion in 2025, dependent upon of course, upon our ability to acquire and get control of the site. So that's really why we need a jail and what we're doing right now. General uh, Center, uh, to fund this project, we will seek county council approval to extend the existing one quarter percent sales tax, which is now primarily paying the bonds in connection with the convention center the Global Center, and the hotel. Those bonds will be paid off in 2027. I have here with me Bob France, Stiefel's Public Finance Managing Director and the county's financial advisor. He'll talk about the cost and how this is going to be funded. Bob? Thank you, Armin. Thank you. Uh, it, similar to many other large-scale projects the county has successfully undertaken in the past, and very similar to uh, many other local governments in Ohio and across the country, uh, the financing plan for the jail project includes the issuance of bonds. Uh, the extension of the quarter percent sales tax will be the primary repayment source for paying debt service charges on the bonds, along with expected operational savings from the new facility. Uh, the numbers on the table uh, here are estimates only, and I stress that uh, these are estimates. Uh, they will change. That's the beauty of estimates. They will change. So these are estimates only. Uh, there are many moving parts that not only impact the project, uh, that will ultimately ultimately impact the financing plan, as Jeff laid out. Uh, but there are many other factors, such as the state of the fixed income municipal market at the time of issuing the bonds, how federal laws could impact the municipal market going forward, uh, federal and state statute impacting financing plan as it pertains to the project and the schedule and many other uh, other factors. Um, 
until the sales tax extension begins to generate revenues in 2028, uh, additional funding from other lawfully available funds at the county will be necessary to fund debt service charges during that time. Uh, current estimates place that number at approximately 30 million. Again, this is an estimate, uh, but uh, it's what we're working with uh, at this time. Um, the financing plan uh, is structured to limit risk to the county and to limit debt service uh, until 2028 when sales tax revenues would be available to produce revenues available for debt service. Uh, currently, we're estimating annual debt service costs of approximately 35 million. Uh, beginning in 2028. Um, all of these numbers assume uh, a, a $550 million uh, budget uh, for the project. So uh, it is on the upward side of uh, what Jeff mentioned before. Uh, but again, it's an estimate only. Um, while the $35 million number is certainly large, um, there's no debating that. Uh, for context, though, the quarter percent sales tax generated approximately $52 million in 2020. Um, many details regarding the bonds will be ironed out and presented to council for approval, uh, but the but the information here, it's, it's estimates of the current plan and uh, you know what we're working with at this time. Um, I'll now turn it back over to Devin uh, for any questions or further comments. Thank you all for your remarks. We now have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, please state your name and media organization when asking a question, and remember to stay muted, please, when not speaking. So we can take a question, please. Hi there, this is uh, Courtney Asalfi with The Plain Dealer in Cleveland.com. Um, I don't think I caught this in your guys' remarks, but please correct me if I'm wrong. How long are you seeking to extend the sales tax? Is it a 20-year extension? Right now, we're looking at uh, an uh, indefinite, no, no closing date. A, a permanent. Okay. All right. And then I'm wondering, you know, excess revenues from the sales tax extension. And um, what do you plan to do with the money that's not needed for the jail? Any excess revenues? Having the additional uh, funds, uh, one, gives us the flexibility in case the budget does uh, need to be adjusted, uh, especially if the uh, population uh, gets out of hand. Uh, but um, uh, one significant benefit for having, for having that addi those additional funds is that we have other capital projects that we're currently considering. Uh, uh, and we uh, will be able to use those funds as needed for those additional projects. One uh, that we're uh, starting to talk about tomorrow is the, uh, is the uh, uh, courts towers uh, as part of the Justice Center. Whether we rehab them or uh, move them, uh, the fact is that they'll be very expensive. All right. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious about the projections that Bob threw out there. I'm wondering if those projections on, on revenues from this, from this extension, you know, um, uh, in revenue, sales tax revenues have increased, you know, a small percentage every year, pretty routinely, not every year, but most years since this was imposed. Um, and I'm wondering, does Bob's projections account for those year-over-year -year routine increases. Bob? Yeah, um, Cordy, there are, we, we're not, uh, as of this time, um, the numbers we're using uh, are not including any growth at all. Okay, so just based off like the 52 million number from 2020? Correct. All righty. And then I, I also have another question for the executive. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that following the state of the county address, you were specifically asked whether you would be proposing raising taxes to pay for a new jail. I understand that this is an extension, not a fresh tax, but the, the fact remains is that people will be paying more starting in 28 indefinitely going forward. So can you please address um, 
you know, maybe the discrepancy between your pledge deck at the state of the county and this new plan now? There is no discrepancy, uh, Courtney. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, this is an extension. This is not an increase. So uh, the fact uh, that in 2028, people will be paying uh, a sales tax, which is no higher than what they're paying now or what they've been paying. Uh, there's no increase to this, uh, to this uh, funding. And it's no different than, uh, you know, when, when school districts pass a, a renewal levy, uh, you know, nobody ever, you know, they're assuming it's not truly more than what the prior levy was. It's a renewal. It's not, it's an extension. It's not a, it's not an increase in taxes. So anyway. All right. Uh, you know, the, the fact that it's running, you know, it's a permanent, permanent increase, you know, it, it wasn't pitched that way back when it was implemented in, in 2007. It was 20 years for a specific project. And now we're potentially looking at a permanent rate here. Every school district that passes a levy, it's a per particular amount of time and it's set to expire. Uh, but when it's renewed, it's renewed. It's not an increase. All right. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from any other media on the call? Okay, well, thank you for your questions. That's all the time we have today. Please reach out if you have any additional questions and we'll get those answered for you. Thank you for joining us and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to today's Cuyahoga County and Board of Health Media Briefing. Today, we are joined by County Executive Armin Budish, Board of Health Commissioner Terry Allen, UH Rainbow and Babies and Children's President Patricia DePompey, Chief Medical Officer for UH Rainbow Babies and Children, Dr. Ethan Leonard, and Board of Health Director of Epidemiology, Surveillance and Informatics, Jana Rush. We'll begin by hearing from our county leaders and then end with some questions. With that, I will turn it over to Executive Budish. Thank you, Devin. Hello, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate all of those who ran for election yesterday. Elections are the engine for our democracy. Putting yourself out there before the public, especially in these times when politics has gotten more and more negative, it's all the more difficult, but but it just makes it more important that good people offer their talents for the voters to consider. And I want to especially congratulate Kevin Kelly and Justin Bibb, who won the right to run in the November election for mayor of Cleveland. Now, once again, I'd like to thank Terry Allen for being here with me. Every couple of weeks when we have these briefings and I listen to the COVID news, I feel like things are getting tougher. And that's because they are. But I always know that Terry and his team will keep us level-headed and prepared to fight the pandemic that we're continuing to face. We're well into our third wave, thanks unfor unfortunately to the Delta variant. If we wanna keep our schools and workplaces open and more of our residents from getting COVID, we need more people to get vaccinated. President Biden just mandated all private employers with more than 100 workers require uh, them to be vaccinated or they must be tested for COVID weekly. We're looking at possibilities. Uh, we're looking at possibilities for county employees, but keep in mind we have more than 30 unions to discuss this with. In the meantime, we're offering $100 as an incentive for our employees to get vaccinated. So I'll plead with all of you again, please get vaccinated now. You can easily find a vaccination site near you by visiting covidvaxonthespot.com. I'll repeat, that's covidvaxonthespot.com. 
It's free, it's effective, and it can save your life. And if you're on Medicaid, the government will give you $100 to get vaccinated. Schools and workplaces need to stay open. We need them to stay open. But our current numbers, which I know Terry and Jan will discuss further, are making that less and less likely. We must do better. We have to stop the spread of this virus, and time is running out. As the weather gets colder and we're forced indoors, chances of spread will only increase. So in partnership with the County Board of Health, effective immediately, we're implementing a mask advisory for all Cuyahoga County residents, regardless of their vaccination status. Our mask advisory strongly urges masking in all indoor areas to prevent a crisis of COVID cases, hospitalizations, and fatalities. We urge our businesses and municipalities to enforce the use of masks in all buildings. And we urge schools to require masks for all students and staff so that kids can stay safe and learning in school. Our fellow Ohio counties have also put mask advisories in place recently. Franklin County, where Columbus is located, Lucas County, which houses Toledo, uh, both of those have adopted the same type of approach. I know masks are annoying, trust me. I enjoyed not having to wear one after I was fully vaccinated and the infection rates dropped. But wearing masks is a small price to pay to protect our children who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated and to protect our parents and grandparents and other vulnerable people and to protect the nurses, the doctors and other healthcare providers who've been risking their lives since day one. We're doing it for all of them. Thank you. And I'll turn it now over to Terry Allen. Well, thank you, Executive Budish, again, for your continued support of public health and our efforts and in joining with us to urge uh, our community to mask indoors and get vaccinated to get us out of this lousy pandemic. On August 4th, a countywide statement recommending mask wearing indoors in all indoor settings went around others and a request for everyone to get vaccinated were made in an attempt to blunt the surging Delta variant. This recommendation included universal, universal masking for all staff and students in schools. These evidence-based public health recommendations follow the CDC guidance for an area with high or substantial uh, transmission of COVID. Over the last month, the Delta variant has continued to surge unabated, even as flu season is upon us. Of grave concern is that other respiratory viruses that we usually see among kids in the fall and winter like RSV and para-influenza are already circulating in the community in addition to COVID. Our current trajectory of cases has us rapidly approaching a level of countywide transmission that is four times the threshold identified by CDC as high transmission, four times the threshold. Modelers at Case Western Reserve University and the University of Akron have validated this disturbing trajectory as they now predicting, they are now predicting that we could exceed a thousand cases per day by early next week if person to person contacts and transmission stay at the current levels and trajectories. These levels would represent our worst days, our worst days from last winter. Area hospitals are reporting that they've reached 80% of their capacity to treat patients who may present with illness just as flu season is starting and their admissions are predicted to increase. Similar to last year, restrictions on visitation and elective procedures will follow in order to handle the demand to treat COVID-19 patients of all ages. We're also seeing a significant increase in COVID-19 cases from exposures in the school environment regarding isolate, requiring isolation and quarantine of students and staff to reduce risk, interrupting the in-person education that we know children need. Just yesterday, Governor DeWine provided clear evidence that COVID cases are higher in schools that are not masking compared to schools that do require masks. Masks will stop the surge of cases in schools. The governor also noted that we are not alone as all 88 counties are now in high transmission. 
In fact, he said, the whole state is on fire. Given these disturbing trends, the children's hospitals across Ohio joined together to urge schools to adopt universal masking requirements to protect children and families. And you'll hear this afternoon from Patty D. Pompey on the impact of these very concerning trends among our uh, uh, children's among our children, based on the experience that they are having at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Clearly, conditions continue to deteriorate, and the risk is rising. If you want to keep our schools and workplaces open, we must meet the imperative to vaccinate more people now and embrace universal masking indoor in all indoor environments when around others. If you're unmasked and unvaccinated indoors and around others, your risk for contracting COVID is very high and will remain so throughout the fall. On the vaccination front, about 54% of residents, just over half of us, have been fully vaccinated and about 33% of the African-American population and 44% of the Hispanic Latinx population have been fully vaccinated. This means that many of us remain unvaccinated and therefore vulnerable and at risk for contracting and spreading the Delta variant in the community. We urge everyone age 12 and older to get vaccinated as soon as they can. Vaccinations are readily available in many places, health departments, hospitals, pharmacies, and community health centers. The data is very clear. Almost all the hospitalizations and fatalities are associated with unvaccinated people. We have to embrace our shared civic responsibility to protect and save as many lives as we can from the ravages of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic and protect our hospitals from being overrun and unable to treat those who need care, particularly our children. Sadly, we're also bracing for increases in fatalities that follow surges in cases. With today's county mask advisory, I join Executive Butish to urge all businesses, nonprofits, cities, villages, and townships to require masks in their buildings and promote vaccination. If we all do our part, we can still avoid the worst if we act now. We continue to collaborate with local foundation community other government agencies, nonprofits, community health centers, hospitals, and grassroots agencies to spread the word on the many locations where vaccine is available in the community. It is by far the leading public health prevention strategy that can slow the spread of COVID in the community and ultimately end the current pandemic. Vaccines continue to be readily available. And remember, you can go to gettheshot.coronavirus.ohio.gov or by calling 211 to find out where you can get vaccinated. Currently, those whose immune systems are compromised moderately or severely are, uh, are eligible to receive an additional dose of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine after the initial two doses. So that's for Pfizer and Moderna. This group represents about 3% of our population. Given the particular risk that the, these health conditions pose, we recommend that these individual individuals contact their doctor get their third dose now as we enter the fall. On September 17th, a key federal advisory committee will be meeting to discuss recommendations related to boosters. We are awaiting the details and guidance from these deliberations to determine how the booster process will roll out. And we, of course, at the health department here, will be working with hospitals, pharmacies, community health centers, and the Cleveland Department of Public Health as we share the responsibility to provide booster doses and continue to offer first and second doses in Cuyahoga County. On the testing front, we remind everyone to get tested if you're experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. And we're seeing major increases in testing volume with the emergence of the Delta variant. We advise parents, students, school faculty, and administrators to go to retail pharmacies to get tested, especially for asymptomatic exposed students and patients. Currently, we understand that area libraries may be out of test kits and are awaiting additional shipments from the state when they're available. Area hospitals have requested that if you are symptomatic and stable or need a confirmatory test, please go to the outpatient care centers or primary care offices for testing. Do not go to the emergency department for testing. It's important to keep our emergency rooms free to help those most in need. 
Please also remember that everyone with a known contact to someone with confirmed COVID-19 disease should get tested three to five days following exposure. It's important to isolate if you have tested positive for COVID-19 in the prior 10 days or are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and, and also to quarantine if exposed to someone who tested positive based on guidance from your local health department. These are proven public health interventions which are key to stopping the spread. Frankly, we may be reaching the point of no return in this current surge if we don't act now to get vaccinated and mask up. Do it for the nurses, for the doctors, and other healthcare providers serving our residents. Do it for the teachers. Do it for the children who are not eligible yet to be vaccinated. Do it for our elderly and other vulnerable populations. And most of all, do it to save as many lives as we can in our community. Thank you for your time and attention. And now I'll turn it over to Patty DePompe. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. I am joined today by our UH Rainbow Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ethan Leonard, who is also a pediatric infectious disease specialist. Ohio is truly blessed to have some of the best children's hospitals in the country. We pride ourselves on meeting the healthcare needs of our kids. Our commitment is really threatened right now. As you have heard, we are now experiencing a sharp rise in pediatric COVID-19 cases, primarily driven by the Delta variant. But we also have increased respiratory illnesses such as RSV, a sharp increase in children requiring admission for mental health needs, and with this rise in volume, staffing challenges. This scenario is a perfect storm. For a long time, COVID-19 was perceived as a disease that didn't impact children. That's not the case anymore. Today, 25% of COVID-19 cases are in kids, and COVID-19 cases are increasing at nearly twice the rate among school-age kids as compared to the rest of our population. As of yesterday afternoon, we have now had over 155,000 cases of COVID-19 in children under the age of 17 in the state of Ohio. 1,528 of these children were ill enough to require hospitalization with some of those children requiring long intensive care unit stays and interventions such as ECMO or heart lung bypass. Tragically, eight children under the age of 17 have now died in our state from COVID-19. We have had multiple examples around the state and at Rainbow where children needing to be transported to other children's hospitals due to lack of ICU beds. Our emergency rooms and urgent cares are seeing unprecedented volumes as you heard from Commissioner Allen. We are testing tens of thousands of children across the state each week. Over 3,800 children were tested last week alone at Rainbow, and our positivity rate on symptomatic children has climbed to 11.2%. I believe everyone can agree that our number one goal is keeping children healthy and in schools five days per week. As Commissioner Allen referenced in Ohio, school districts where masks are optional among school-aged kids, there are both higher case rates and a greater over and a greater week over week increase in COVID-19 cases. We are asking and urging all Ohioans and Cuyahoga County residents to do what you can to protect our county's children by using proven tools that we have. If you are eligible, please get vaccinated. Please wear a mask in indoor venues and support your school district in assuring that all children are a mask during school. Please adhere to proven safe practices of physical distancing and hand washing. Together, we know we can keep our children safer. They need us to each do our part, and they need us now. And I'm really pleased to turn it over to Director Jana Rush. Jana. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I will be covering some of the key metrics uh, and trends that we've been seeing uh, with COVID-19 as the Delta variant is surging throughout Ohio as well as in Cuyahoga County. So for our reported cases, we're currently averaging about 300 cases per day. Just to put that into perspective, um, that's over a 600% increase from where we were just in July. 
um, we were averaging about 35 per day. So a very sharp, sharp increase in the number of cases that we're seeing in a very short period of time, uh, which is different than what we were seeing back uh, in the beginning of the fall of 2020. And currently our incidence rate, we're at about 357 cases per 100,000. Uh, this remains lower than the state average, but as was mentioned earlier by Commissioner Allen, the entire state of Ohio is in the red zone, meaning that we have a high incidence of transmission happening throughout the entire state. And it was also mentioned about the trajectory of the cases that we're expected to see. So uh, last year, we saw over 1,000 cases per day being reported. That was back in November, of December, November and December of 2020. And so now we're at pace to have that happen much earlier, meaning that, you know, if that happens within the next 30 days, you know, we can be well over uh, even a thousand cases per day uh, as we move further into the winter. And so something else that I want to highlight today is to talk about children and schools and what we're seeing in cases amongst uh, that population. So what we've observed is that school cases have continued to rise each week since the beginning of the 2021-2022 school year. Um, we've had the highest case count reported this school year with 426 cases being reported to date. So we've also noticed that we've had an increase of about 50% every week in the number of cases among children in schools. And that's 50% higher as well than what we were seeing in the 2020-2021 school year. So we're already starting out you know, with a much higher number of cases being reported among school students. Um, to date, there's been nearly a thousand cases reported uh, total uh, for the school year with over 80% of those occurring just in the last two weeks. So what we're seeing here with those school cases is that they're rapidly uh, increasing in a much shorter condensed amount of time than what we were seeing last school year. And our highest number of cases are among those that are 16 years of age and 17 years of age with a median age of 12. Um, we had 130 children, 0 to 17, that have been hospitalized so far, and the highest number of those cases have been among those that are less than one year of age and those that are 16 to 17 years old with a median of 11 years of age. And just over the past two weeks, um, uh, you know, uh, a trend that we noticed or that we're starting to see is that the number of hospitalizations among children just over the past two weeks, so among those 0 to 19, has matched those of adults that are 50 to 59. Um, very unfortunate, but that is the trend that we're starting to see with this Delta variant. And then among those that are 0 to 17, about 14% of children are currently vaccinated within our jurisdiction. So we know, of course, that's much lower than what we see in our adult populations where we have upwards of 50% or more, um, and that increases with age with the number of those that are vaccinated. Um, so I'll move on and shift to testing. So countywide, our positivity rate again has increased. So we went from a 6% positivity rate to now we're over 6.5% through the end of August. So we were at 6%. Uh, mid-August. So that rate represents the highest rate we've seen in ODH since we began this countywide reporting. And so we've also noticed that the number of tests have also increased that are being uh, sampled. So over 70,000 tests were ran just over the past week. Again, that's more than double than what we were seeing just back at the beginning of August. So in relation to vaccinations, as M Commissioner Allen also stated earlier, we've pretty much uh, been at a stable rate of having about 53% of the population in Cuyahoga County fully vaccinated. And that's just remained stable. So we kind of stalled there in relation to the number of people that are being vaccinated. But we are seeing an increase, increase most recently over the past two weeks. Just last week, we had 6,000 residents who were vaccinated uh, for COVID-19 and completed that. And we were at 3,000 at the beginning of August. So that's double of what we were seeing just from about a month and a half ago. So that's encouraging to see since we've kind of been flat um, around that 50% range for our um, vaccination in the county. And then for hospitalizations, we're currently averaging about 300 patients uh, per day that are in the hospital 
uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, we are learning, as we stated earlier as well, uh, we have 80% utilization with our adult beds and we're at about 50% uh, for our pediatric beds, but we are also we are also learning that for our ICU beds, we are at more than 90% capacity. Uh, so we're definitely increasing significantly there as well. And so you know we have to be mindful of that as diversion starts to happen, um, where we're not able to uh, have people come into the hospital for other things um, that may be of concern for patients. And so with this surge in cases, we're also seeing the deaths increase. So uh, we began averaging about two deaths per week um, earlier in the spring as cases had began to subside, and that's now increased to a, about five deaths per week. And then just last week, we had nine deaths reported um, in the matter of one week. So as you can see, again, the same trend is happening with cases, hospitalizations, as well as deaths. These Cases are doubling, tripling, uh, sometimes just within a very condensed time frame. So within four weeks to two weeks, we're seeing these uh, things kind of snowball uh, over the last several weeks. Another statistic that I wanted to point out is that our average age for our deaths is still older adults. So 78 years is the average age, but we do have a range of 28 years to 102 years for uh, people who have died as, as a result of COVID-19. So it definitely does impact younger people as well as older people. And 98% of all of the deaths that have occurred during 2021 have been attributed to those who are unvaccinated. So we still know that the majority of the severe outcomes that are resulting from COVID-19 are in relation to those who are unvaccinated. And another statistic that I want to point out is that the ratio of deaths among those, all deaths among those uh, who have uh, contracted COVID-19 compared to those who are uh, vaccinated or, or unvaccinated, I'm sorry, is 40 to 1. So we know that, again, vaccination is really protecting people from those severe outcomes, 40 times more likely uh, to result in a severe outcome of hospitalization, uh, particularly here for death, is 40 to 1 uh, for people who are unvaccinated. And so in closing, what I want to mention is that Delta is different. Uh, we are seeing a difference in transmission and the populations that are impacted due to the Delta variant. It is impacting people that are younger. Uh, we are seeing transmission and breakthrough cases happen, um, especially, like I said, among the, amongst those who are vaccinated, we're seeing more severe illness uh, happening with those patients. And so we need to do all that we can to prevent this fall from being worse than last fall. And at the trajectory that cases, hospitalizations uh, are rising in such a short amount of time, we're definitely on track for that to happen. But what we can do is the same basic public health measures that work, vaccines, masks, social distancing, isolation, and quarantine. There are tried and true public health methods that work to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. And so I know that, um, you know, as we've said many times before, we're all tired, but we all have to continue to do our part if we want to avoid the most difficult paths that are ahead that may impact our day-to-day -day lives. And with that, I'll close and turn it over for questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jana, and thank you all for your remarks. We know we now have a few questions. Um, please state your name and media organization when asking a question, and remember to stay muted when not speaking. So does anybody have a question? This is Lisa Ryan with uh, WCPN IdeaStream Public Media. And I'm wondering um, what the mask advisory actually means um, Will there be any requirements? How will you be getting messages out to businesses and other places to try to get them to require masking in indoor public spaces? Um, what are some of the more details about that? Thank you, Lisa, Thank you for your question. Yes, so we will have the advisory posted on our website uh, and we would then work with uh, our uh, Mayor City Managers Association. We'll work with our local associations through chambers, et cetera, to get the word out. Uh, to make sure that people are aware. We know many municipalities have already 
tried to move forward to adapt a, a masking or recommendations or masking requirements in buildings, particularly in senior centers, which makes certainly makes good sense. So we'll spread the word out after uh, uh, today with the notice of it. And what the difference here for us is that we now know the level of urgency that you should be hearing in the voices of everyone that's uh, participating today. Um, it shows us that at this point we're at the we're in the precipice uh, of whether we are going to be able to suppress this variant or we're in for a very very difficult fall and a lot of heartache that we can avoid if people uh, begin to adopt these measures if they get vaccinated if they wear a mask we know the data is clear that in school environments if you're masking you're going to have less cases that's been made clear statewide President DePompey just described that. So certainly we want you to now embrace this. We've seen more in, in public settings, in stores that people are starting to mask. I do think that if you set examples as you're moving about the community, other people uh, will follow suit. But uh, we have a civic responsibility to protect each other. And we wanna protect our kids. We all wanna protect our kids. So this is the best way to do it. You roll up your sleeve if you've been waiting for some reason and you wear that mask and we'll all be better off, but we'll spread the word uh, in the wake of uh, today's announcement, Lisa. So thanks for your question. Um, yeah, in addition, you know, just- keep... Sorry. That's okay. I was just gonna add that uh, we also uh, will work to get the advisory out. Uh, we have uh, active social media presence. We um, uh, have our website, which is uh, well uh, viewed. Uh, and uh, we're regularly meeting with uh, organizations and leaders throughout the community. Um, but there, there isn't any consequence that will happen if people don't wear masks, because I, I'm wondering if people will hear this and think um, that they won't have to change anything. Well, I think uh, we're, we're hoping that people, um, certainly um, we're calling upon their better angels at this point, because we, we really recognize that uh, when kids are, when, when they're having issues, we heard reports and, and uh, President Dee Pompey uh, described uh, what's happening in the Children's Hospital here, but reports from around the state where in Toledo, they had to go on diversion where none of the hospitals were available to serve people in their community for an eight hour period. They were all full. So there was nowhere for anyone to go that needed help for any reason in an emerg for emergency care. And certainly Dr. Leonard can describe what he's seeing and the pain and suffering that people have experienced in those settings. We want people to take that to heart. And uh, what's different from last year this time is we are not in a lockdown. We uh, are seeing the distancing. We don't have the remote work to the degree we did. People are moving freely about the community and there has been less masking. Uh, and so we need to recognize that that's what's different and Delta is different. So there are a number of things now that make our risks significantly higher going into the fall. And uh, we don't want to have a very, very dark winter. We want to have a better outlook by, uh, by engaging people and appealing to them now to do the right thing and to do it not for them uh, alone, but for all the people around them and for the kids. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. I'll say that we have seen almost a doubling of our census of children admitted with COVID. We serve a several county region. We're diagnosing about 60 cases of COVID a day. About 5% of those need to be admitted. We have several of those children in our intensive care unit requiring a breathing tube and, and a ventilator um, or non-invasive non ventilation modalities that we talk about, but these are sick kids um, and they're almost uniformly unimmunized, um, either because their family didn't get them immunized, they're too young to be immunized, and the families weren't immunized. Um, so again, we can't implore people strongly enough to get immunized, to wear a mask, uh, and to protect our kids and the rest of the family members. And I will add, we've also opened a long COVID clinic just for children because the sequelae of COVID doesn't stop once a child's discharged from the hospital. There can be sequelae that last for months. And these are kids that really are suffering. And again, we can't emphasize it enough. We all have to protect each other, but especially those who can't be vaccinated. And right now, those are children under the age of 12. 
When you ask about the consequences, I'll answer from my view directly. There's no fines. There's no criminal penalties. The consequences are people will get sick and some of them will die. All right. Well, thank you for your questions. Really appreciate it. That concludes this week's briefing. Thank you for joining us and we will see you in a few weeks. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.